So Darren, I'm going to go to you first. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, like what Brad was alluding to, you know, the origin of Gate World and you started popping up and, and really how far it's come, right? It's still the source uh, for, Get, you know, Stargate. It's been a really amazing ride, to be honest. Uh, Gate World is celebrating its 24th birthday uh, in a couple of weeks, right? So it's uh, it's been the majority of my adult life. Um, my I don't even have any children that are that age yet. Uh, but because we're talking about fandom and we're talking about history, I, I want to start by giving a shout out to the website that preceded Gate World. There was a big fan site. Brad, I don't know if you remember this. I think it was SG1.net, and it was, oh, yeah. a, it was a high school kid, and right. I, MGM ended up basically buying his site and bringing him on, and then he, he had a set visit in season four. And then I remember that. Well, I don't remember his name. There were yeah, pictures yeah. On, I can't remember his name. I, I apologize if he's watching, but uh, the story was he went off to film school, and MGM bought his site, and as these things tend to happen, it, it disappeared. And it was kind of lost to internet history. So I've been really proud that Gate World has survived as long as it has, in part because, well, number one, because of Brad's support and the support of the studio, the support of MGM and everybody at, at Bridge. We couldn't do what we do if we didn't have their support. My first set visit was in season eight. Um, and if we didn't have people who wanted to well, you know, watch the show and then come online and talk about it and read news and maybe even some spoilers now and again. Uh, so it's been an incredible ride. It's been really wonderful. Thanks, Darren. 24 years. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you were a kid. You had to be a kid when you started. I was. I was one year out of college. I think I was 23. I have the same experience, but kind of being towards the end of the queue, listening to all these great interview questions and just enjoying everything as it goes. And my just question wind is me up. I'll, I, I can talk for 15 minutes. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I, I, folks might know if they've been around for a while, the uh, Gate World used to visit the set annually when yeah. you guys were in production. And I, you know, I was a kid. I was really nervous walking around, you know talking with Joe Flanagan and Tori Higginson and Amanda Tapping. And then we'd go upstairs to the writer's room and, and you were the easiest interview because I could just walk into your office, plop down on the couch and say, Brad, what's going on? And yeah. you would talk for 20 minutes. Yeah, that's I'm like a wind up toy. I can just uh, pull my string and off I go. Yep, 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 yep. Well, I, I want to ask you first about your craft because uh, I've read, I've been following your work since The Outer Limits, all the way through years and years of Stargate and through Travelers. As you've moved through your career and had those different experiences, what are the elements that you would say make up a good writer's room? Uh, how are the writers, the different writers' rooms that you've been a part of, how have they differed from each other? That's a that's an interesting question. Um, the Outer Limits was. Uh, it was because we were each writing individual stories. It, it, there was never an arc that we had to worry about tying into. So basically, I would go into Jonathan's or Scott's or Manny's office back in season one and say, how about this? And they would say, that's cool. Let's pitch that to Trilogy. Trilogy was the uh, uh, the uh, the studio. I, no, not the studio. The, MGM was the studio. But they were the production entity that had sold The Outer Limits to... Uh, uh, to MGM. So I would, I, 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 then we'd have to pitch that and, and it would just be like a document. What about this? And, and they had, and it was, they would just go, yes, no, yes, no. And, and we would either do, write an outline and, and, and it would get developed further or, you know, I would just write the damn thing and say, here, how about this? And we got so desperate on the other limits uh, because we were a little behind when I started on that show. Um, but John and I were very good at working together and spinning story, Jonathan and I. And, and we did that on The Outer Limits together. So when we came to uh, Stargate, uh, the writer's room was catch as catch can. It was, we, we, were, we were never all together for any length of time, uh, except at the beginning of the season, uh, in a real room, and, and enough, long enough to, to even call it a writer's room. It was like, hey guys, can we steal an hour? You know, and we'd all sit and we'd spin the idea or whatever we needed to spin, and and that kind of just carried over into the rest of the sh the rest of the show. Um, 
except for the beginning of the season and the end of the season when we actually sat and were able to sit down. We we did not have a structured writer's room in the same way that, that for example, I was able to do on Travelers. Um, with Travelers, uh, and, and, it's, and it was a giant, we, we had three or four weeks and, and then all through prep, it was me and the writers spinning stories uh, breaking stories on the whiteboard, all of which we did in in uh, Stargate, but but in a more structured way, in a more if, uh, in a more all at once way. Uh, and it, part of it was because John and I were also producing the Outer Limits, uh, so we just didn't have the time. We just we were like grabbing time to to put stuff on a whiteboard, and. Um, and uh, break stories. And uh, we got better at it. And we got more, uh, we started devoting more time to it. When, uh, but, and I have to say, um, there is no more fun place than a writer's room uh, when you're on fire. There is, it's just, especially uh, if you, when you have people as funny as Martin Garrow and making you, Paul Molly, just making you cry laughing at, at, at you know, anything that, uh, that, you know, we're discussing and uh, in context or out of context. And, and uh, that continued into Travelers. Uh, I, uh, it, it is just so much fun to spin story. It can be frustrating as hell. It can be, it can be painful <laughs> because you're, you know, you're, you know there's something there this thing is in the way or, or whatever. And, 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 you know, you don't have an act four. It's always act four, as Joe yeah. Lawrence would say. <laughs> but, um, uh, but it's so satisfying when you, when you, when you come away and go, drive home and think and go, yeah, that was good. That was like, it was exhausting. It can be really exhausting, but so much fun. Um, and then, and then what I learned, another thing I learned on travelers, uh, uh, was you, you, you uh, you break a story, and, and and this is what we started doing. We broke the story again. We would wipe it off the board and do it again. Amazingly, when you try to do it a second time, all the glue and spit that was holding together the version one reveals itself, and you and it quite often is you know different in what and and it, and uh, it's like the second pass on on a on a on any draft, and and it's but. It, by starting from scratch, you, like it's a proof of concept, a proof that, oh yeah, this is a good story or this isn't a good story. Hmm. Uh, but there is no more, there's no more fun place in the world yeah. than you know, a bunch of people in a writer's room. One of the really fun stories that, that you contributed to the Stargate world was season four is 2010 and yeah. season five is 2001. Uh, we've heard whispers over the years that, that the Ashen were going to be a trilogy. So I wonder if you could talk us through the, the genesis of the idea. How did the Ashen come about and how this idea gets developed in the writer's room? And then why didn't that third one come about? What was in the way that you couldn't it overcome? Could, it, could have, it could have, and I could have probably come up with another Ashen story uh, because they would have been angry with what we did to them after 2001. Uh, after that episode, um, uh, I, I, I but I laugh and smile every time you say it because Rob was not a fan. I mean, he liked the episodes, he liked, but he didn't like them as a villain. He didn't like the slow game, the long game that that the Ashin played out. Like, mm -hmm. you know, well, oh, they're going to starve us out. It's, and Rob went, oh, oh my God, they're not growing corn. Is not a great. <laughs> you know. And I yeah, again. Funny writers are a moment, but um, but uh, though I, I mean, 2010 is arguably my my favorite of my own uh, episodes because yeah. mainly because Andy McKee did such a great job directing it, and it was one of his first uh, directing assignments. Uh, the last act uh, is is like a feature, and Joel's music again was spectacular, but. Um, the, the, the story that sort of came to mind in terms of the Ashen coming directly without a Stargate to Worth ended up being uh, a, a component of one of the uh, directed video movies indirectly. I mean, I can't even say it's the same, but it just felt like it stepped on it. So I think that the, uh, that, that was the reason. 
uh, and I may even be wrong about that. <laughs> I mean, because you but were already was, planning the sort of Earth invasion for a different race, for a different storyline? Yeah, something like that. That's good. Um, one of the things that I do on GateWorld is uh, we sort of think of ourselves as chronicling the history of the show, the history of production, which is why I ask all these sort of backward looking questions. I think a lot of people who have been around for a while, they know that there were a couple of movies that didn't get made. Joe and Paul's Stargate Extinction script for Atlantis. And I think it was you and Carl were working together on Stargate Revolution. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And, and the truth is they, they not only didn't get made, they, they were really relatively early in their, uh, in, in their development. It's not like we were, we had a script that we could have shot. We were still, you know, that we had first drafts, I think. And <clears throat> they were something we were planning to do like six months down the road. And, uh, and it, and it was because of the, uh, continuum and arc of truth did very well for, uh, for MGM as direct to video movies and and uh, the market for a direct it was it, it was a good business model it was a, it was a really solid business model and it was a way especially for Atlantis to keep going um, because the television model was was uh, arguably going to be difficult um, and and we love doing it. I, Rob and I, Rob loved making Eric Truth. I love making Continuum. And uh, and I thought, man, I could make two of these a year for for a while. Right. This would be great. And uh, and it was it was purely the 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 collapse of the DVD market uh, that 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 triggered the the uh, sidelining of those projects. And it began as. Could you just like put a hold on development for for a couple of weeks? Because because we're getting some numbers here that are literally a month later. Yeah, I think we need to put a like a like just just a stop on development on this for for now and just see how it. And then a month later, forget yeah. it. There's no way we can make these. Well, and really and Continuum to... was one of the last movies MGM released direct to DVD that made money. Yeah. What I really want to ask about is the movie that uh, didn't get as far and most people probably don't know about, which is the one that you mentioned earlier in the live stream, uh, a sort of combo team up of, of characters from all three shows uh, to give some kind of conclusion to Destiny's story. How far did that get into development and what can you share with us about uh, what it well, would be? I just started typing, Darren. I, 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 I asked uh, my, uh, my boss at MGM, who was a huge Stargate fan and was kind of mortified by the fact that all of this was happening. Uh, and I said, look, we have many millions of dollars worth of sets here that are going to have to get packed up and, 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 and basically discarded. And if I can get a script in your hands quickly enough, I bet I can get the cast of SGU and 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 bring aboard enough cast members from the other show that um, that I could at least give us a, a, a two hour movie to wrap it up or a ninety minute movie to to wrap up SGU and finish the story that we were trying to tell and I I had a, I I pitched him the rough idea I had for it and, and it was rough I mean I you know I was typing as fast as I could and my process is not like like well, I didn't, I didn't whiteboard it. I just had this sort of structure in my head and and concept of the characters from the other series that I was going to bring in, and I and I started writing it, started laying it out, and uh, and uh, it started with, uh, you know, it started with McKay, and and, you know, and it began a recognition that Destiny was in trouble, and um, and there, you know. I don't want to go into the plot details, but the, 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 at the end of the day, before I really got into any, like two weeks into the, the process, I found out it's not going to happen. Yeah. And, and, uh, and even, even as we were going through it, it was, could you do it for this number? Could you do it for this number? Could, and then it got to the point where I look, I'm already, I've already taken my own, my own producing fee out of the budget, <laughs> but I can't take yeah, visual effects out of the budget. You do it with hand puppets. <laughs> you know, we can't, it, it, there's a, there's, there comes a time where, where 
the desire to finish something doesn't line up with the financial resources to do it. And that's, that was where it was already heading when, when I found out they're not, they're not interested. They're not, the new regime was just not remotely interested. Mm. Yeah. That's my memory is that it was, it was 2011, I think by my reporting. Yeah. Uh, so this would have been after the bankruptcy, after there was a, a new set of people inside MGM. Yes. It was, it was, uh, it was, uh, I was writing, uh, but we had let the sets up um, out, out, out of the hope that we right. could do that. And we, uh, we funded it with, uh, I can't even remember how we funded it. We had an underage that season. And the, the truth is it, 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 you know, it probably cost MGM a few bucks to, to, for that show of good faith and the hope that we could keep the, keep uh, the, the, flame alive if you will and uh, it was that was sad because i was trying really hard i mean i i just you know i had been spoiled for so many years darren of of, of them saying well come up with another one well come up with another one mm -hmm. and 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 to have something that was not only out of my control but out of the control of the executives at mgm i was working with a structured bankruptcy means everybody goes home and the new a new regime comes in and takes over yeah. And the new regime was not interested. Yeah. Well, uh, we're on our one minute countdown. There's Lawrence. L oh. Let me ask you one last question. Uh, kind of sure. looking forward, right? We've, we've been pushing hard for a lot of years for, for your involvement in the next project. And if not your involvement, then, then the universe that you helped to build to, to continue on with that continuity. Um, You've always said in, in interviews like here at The Companion and on your Reddit AMA that you think one of the core ideas about Stargate is that it's us. That these characters are yeah. relatable or they're contemporary. Sure. Uh, so Jerem FG on GateWorld asks, do you believe that that here and now is still the secret ingredient to GateWorld's future success, even under this new paradigm of binge watching, serialization, streaming series? And then I'll just add to that by asking, in your mind, under, you know, in new creative hands, is there room for something like a Stargate, the next generation that's actually set a few decades in the future? The answer is, is, is absolutely yes. Um, because, um, because frankly, one of the difficulties, and I, and I say this as somebody who would probably benefit <laughs> Uh, from a in canon uh, continuation, uh, the I get the rationale for a reset, but a next generation is sort of a happy medium because it is sort of a reset. It is enough in the future that that um, uh, that the that the world is different. But the one thing, another thing that happened in Stargate, and I know Lawrence, you're probably, uh, but if you're next, I can make you wait, right? <laughs> I made you a promise at 89 minutes and we are at 92. So okay. I'll, we'll worry, go right. fast. We'll go fast. Okay. Darren, please uh, answer. The, the, the thing that you can't do uh, if you do a next a future Earth is is you know walk around Earth the way it is right now. You know, you have to be Earth has advanced. And I say this, I, I, I had this conversation with uh, my producing partner, Carrie Mudd, uh, about another idea that we had, and I said it's so hard to do the future. You can't, you, if you do something set 80 years from now, you know, what do the cars look like? You know, what, what does, what does earth look like? You know, what are the social norms? What are the politics? You can't, you can't, it's, it's a whole other world building in addition to yeah. the sci-fi component, right? And everything has to be shot on sound stages. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, and you know, uh, honestly, Star Trek is doing a pretty good job of it. Uh, of modern Earth, they really are, uh, uh, and uh, but they have a they have a lot of money. They have a lot of money. So if you do that, then my my suggestion is have a lot of money. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, good good answer. <laughs> uh, thank you. It's always a joy. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. And it's good to see you. You too. I, pre I appreciate the decades long support. Well, let's do it again. Okay. Hey guys, it's just amazing that we keep doing, that we get to do this. Uh, so I want to say thank you to The Companion. Thank you to Sidetrack. Thank you to Three Fries, Dial the Gate, 
this is kind of an amazing thing that Stargate fandom is this cool and that we have this kind of platform and that we have the people who made the the content that we love so much. Sorry, I'm not supposed to call it content. The art that we love so much uh, here and still willing to talk about it all these years later. So thank you, Brad, for giving us uh, your time. Stargate is an, it, becoming an intergenerational thing and it has been for years, right? We've heard stories for so many years about people who introduce their kids to the show. Well, I finally introduced my kids to the show on the umpteenth rewatch. And you know what? Just last night, we finished Atlantis. So wow. we've watched two of your three shows so far with my three kids. And now I get to have that experience of sharing that, that thing that I love so much with them. And that's always going to be a part of our lives. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I love... I love hearing that, and I love it when new generations find a show that I started over 25 years ago. It's remarkable.